Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 19th, 2012, and my guest is Luigi Zingales, Robert McCormick Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. His latest book is A Capitalism for the People. Luigi, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Your book is a really fantastic ride through a whole bunch of interesting economic and philosophical and ethical issues related to the current state of the economy and how it might become better. And I hope we can capture some of the flavor of that book in this podcast, but I want to recommend it very strongly to our listeners as uh, just a fascinating and and very educational look at, at a wide range of issues that many of which we have touched on in this podcast, but uh, Luigi, you come up with some different takes and some different explanations, and it just it's a very interesting book. You start off by talking about the United States history and capitalism's history in the United States, and you talk about uh, meritocracy and it, the idea that it is at risk. Talk about what you mean by a meritocracy and why you think it is at risk uh, in America these days. So a meritocracy is a system where reward and responsibility is attributed on the basis on the basis of uh, of uh, quality and merit so uh you promote uh, uh the most capable manager uh you have in the university uh the professors being the most uh, uh bright and uh, productive researchers and teachers and so on and so forth it seems like uh, it's an obvious sort of a uh, system uh, but much of the world is not dominated by uh, a meritocracy. It's all uh, uh, based on, uh, at least historically, on right of birth. Uh, and if you are the son of a king, you become a king, uh, regardless of how stupid you are. And uh, in, if you are the son of a large landowner, you tend to be the la- landowner, regardless of how stupid you are, and, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, uh, even recently, uh, a lot is allocated based on political connections. In uh, you are you become sort of a, a, a large manager of a state-owned company because you have uh, uh, friends in high places and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not as straightforward as it, uh, it, it w- most people make it to be. The, the, the second point is that uh, one essential element of meritocracy is that you have uh, some level of uh, pay inequality. In order to motivate people to do better, uh, you have to pay them more. And uh, so there is an intrinsic tension between uh, meritocracy and democracy, because democracy uh, tends to have a more equalized pay, because uh, uh, the vast majority of people tend to be envious with people who make more. Uh, and how you make compatible a meritocracy and a democracy is really a challenge, a challenge that, in my view, historically the United States have resolved, uh, has resolved very well, and I don't think that uh, is resolving as well today. Well, and one of the ways we solved it historically, although <clears throat> well, one of the ways we solved it historically is the Constitution, which limits the power of the democracy for the majority to extract resources from the minority. Uh, there are also strong cultural norms, uh, a theme that runs through your book. One of the reasons it's such an interesting book is that you it, you don't ignore those norms as an economist, and I don't think an economist should. So I really, I, I really enjoyed that part of the book. But you're obviously, as the Constitution has um, eroded somewhat in limiting, or maybe a lot, in limiting the powers of government as government's gotten stronger, uh, the ability of the of the, of the body uh, politic to extract resources from uh, the few is growing. But as you focus on in the book, uh, unfortunately, the minority is also extracting a lot from the, major- from the majority because of their political power. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, 
there is definitely a sense uh, of this. I always tell uh, this, this true story that uh, I teach entrepreneurship, and in 2009, I had some young fellows approaching me with a business idea, um, and it was an interesting idea, so I sort of spent some time talking to them, and then I asked them why they came to me. I'm not the only professor of entrepreneurship in the country, so uh, why did they pick me? And uh, to my disappointment, the answer is, oh, because uh, you write a lot, you are a public figure, and so you might help us lobbying for getting more of the top money from Washington into our uh, business venture. And I said, uh, wait a minute, if a startup thinks about lobbying as the first activity, we're really in deep trouble. Yeah, that's a really bad sign. Uh, I I certainly agree with that. Why else? What are some of the other reasons you think – there's some trends in our economic system that some of which are misleading, but certainly look very bad, which have gotten people worried about the state of the income distribution. Talk about some of those trends and, and why they pose political threats to the current, to the, to a real, a real capitalism. So I think that in order to have a support for, for a, a meritocracy and a, and a free market system, uh, we need to have uh, a generalized perception that uh, uh, this is creating wealth, that it, uh, everybody gets uh, a decent share of this wealth that is created, and that the system overall is fair. And unfortunately, all these three conditions are, are weakening in, in the United States in recent years. In a sense, uh, the rate of growth has gone down on average. Uh, this is true for all the industrialized nations, but this does create uh, more problem uh, because the uh, the pie is not shrinking, but it's not growing at such a high rate that uh, everybody's benefit from it. And then uh, we have a, a worsening of the income inequality. And in particular, I think that uh, there is a, a significant fraction uh, that is falling behind. And uh, uh, the typical uh, American dream was that uh, my kids will be uh, wealthier than I am. And uh, uh, a large fraction of the population today does not experience that. In the median uh, young fellow male that enters the workforce at age 20 or 22 uh, is making 19% less in real terms than uh, his father made at the same age. So I think that uh, that's clearly a, a challenge. Now, part of that has to do with the fact that, uh, at least in my view, uh, the United States had it very easy uh, at, at the end of World War II, and there was sort of a, kind of a, a, a rent or a surplus that was divided uh, uh, among the population that made everybody better off. So, uh, I, unfortunately, uh, it's not easy to reverse this, this, this trend, but this creates clearly a problem of consensus. And then to add insult to injury, there is a, a generalized perception uh, that uh, I don't think is typical of this country uh, of mistrust toward sort of uh, the way the institutions work and uh, the way the, the rules of the game are, are designed. One thing that struck me as an Italian movie to America was uh, the, the trust that the uh, average American uh, had, at least at the time, toward their institutions, which is completely unheard of in Italy. Yeah, tell the story. And, uh, tell the story about about the taping up of the windows, because yeah, it's a it's a one liner, but it's a good line. <laughs> one one of the first things that uh, happened was a tornado watch in Boston, and so they there was this uh, public ordinance that you had to go home, uh, tape your windows, and stay inside. And my reaction in Italian is, if the mayor tells me to tape the window, must be that his brother is selling tape. <laughs> And uh, the fact that he's telling me to stay inside means that I have to do exactly the opposite because uh, my experience in Italy, if you do the opposite of what the government tells you to do, you're, you're doing fine. Uh, and I think that was not the, the tradition here. And, and I admire, and I think that a lot of things uh, work better because there is this, this trust, or there was this trust. And, and this trust was, was not completely sort of uh, uh, unjustified. Um, yeah. I think that there is not a, it's not a coincidence that... Uh, uh, the United States are the, the first idea of government uh, for the people, by the people, and of the people. Um, I think that in, in recent years, and, and the bailout play a big role in that, but yep. uh, I think it was more like uh, uh, a, a way, a turning point. People started to focus and realize that things were, were changing. 
uh, that uh, you have this perception that the government is run by sort of uh, uh, cooperation and their interest rather than the interest of the people at large. Uh, shortly after the, the financial bailout, um, I ran with a colleague of Kellogg a, a, a um, survey that's called the Financial Trust Index, where we try to get a sense of how much uh, Americans trust their financial system. And we have some questions about institutions as well. And one question we ask at the end of 08 was, do you think that uh, in, uh, in the um, bailout, uh, uh, Hank Paulson acted in the interest of the country or in the interest of Goldman Sachs? And of the 80% of the people who responded to that question, 50% said in the interest of Goldman Sachs, which is pretty scary. And then shortly after, we, we, six months later, we asked a similar question with uh, Obama. And uh, the only difference is now people were divided whether Obama was acting in the interest of the union or in the interest of the financial industry. Yeah. But uh, still, only a minority thought was acting in the interest of the country. How would you answer so, that question, I, by the way? On the go- Let's go back to Hank Paulson. I think that it's a tough uh, question. It's a tough uh, question. You only have it's a, it's a You only have question. two answers, and, and I think that uh, <laughs> he. I think he was honest in acting in the interest of uh, the country, but uh, he thought the interest of the country and the interest of Goldman Sachs were one and the same. Yeah, that's what I think the problem is. Uh, we'll come back to that later. The other thing I want to just mention in passing, uh, and I think we'll come back to later, is. Um, you said that the average male worker, the median male worker today, makes 19 percent less than his than his um, father. Do you believe that number? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, first of all, uh, I said on purpose males because females had an improvement in income distribution. So uh, I think in part is, a, is if you want a reequalization that uh, maybe males uh, uh, 25 years ago were earning uh, a rent at the expense of females, and now things have equalized, So, because a, a female would make more. Uh, but it is true. Uh, in, in this, my, my interpretation is that um, in the 20 or 30 years immediately after World War II, the United States stands out as the only place on earth to do business in a particular way. And as a result of this uh, uniqueness, everybody was getting a rent just out of being American. And so if I uh, wanted to invest, why would I invest even in countries like France or Italy that could fall, easily fall uh, under communist regime? Uh, I will only invest in the United States. And why should I invest in India where there was sort of no rule of law and not uh, even uh, a appearance of capitalism? Uh, so as a result of that, uh, just out of being an American living in the United States, I was getting sort of a rent. The, the people in this country were sort of uh, a, a scarce resource. And as we know in economics, every scarce resource is earning a rent. Uh, this rent has disappeared because today uh, there are Indians and, Indians and Chinese and sort of uh, Brazilians and uh, you name them that uh, are uh, as good as, as effective. And uh, while I think this is still probably the best country to do business, other countries are not so far behind. But, uh, but that's uh, the As a result, I think that uh, the average American is facing a, a tougher competition from the rest of the world. Now, this is fantastic for the rest of the world. This is, if we look from a, a, a world perspective, uh, I think that uh, this is, has created the largest uh, um, amount of wealth uh, in the history of humankind, probably. And this For is sure. the, the coming to um, richness, richness of uh, uh, China and India are fantastic phenomena, but have some bad repercussions at all. Yeah, I just don't, I don't believe that number. We've talked about it a lot in this program. Maybe we'll come back and talk to it later. You know, I think uh, it might be true of people who don't, who didn't finish high school. I think that's true that the median high school dropout doesn't do as well as he did 25 years ago, but there's a great deal of evidence that suggests a, a different story. And I think it's a um, challenge of, of how, which data you want to interpret and how you want to talk sure, about no, it. No, I think that, look, depending on how you cut it, if you look at, for example, a household income yeah. or individual wage, 
the, the number is very different yeah. because uh, we have more female participation. So uh, I am not obsessed on sort of uh, the exact level of that number. However, I think that all the numbers point in the fact that uh, uh, you don't have a bright prospect in front of you if you are not particularly well educated. So I agree the, with that. The, the median American with a high school degree uh, does not have a bright future as he used to have 25 years ago. I agree with that. I think that uh, th- that's. I, I think that's pretty much a fact. So then I agree with that. It's sort of making more or less than uh, we can debate. but uh, And you can uh, argue how you compute inflation. Uh, yep. We know the inflation tends to be overstated, so maybe if, in real terms it's yep. making a bit more. But I think that uh, we're going from a world in which, uh, if I remember correctly, in a generation you are gaining 79%, so you are like twice as rich as your parents, to a world in which we are debating whether you're richer or not. So that, that's, a, that's a dramatic change. No, I'll agree with that. Let, let's move on. Now, as an example of how inequality has, for the reasons behind inequality, uh, increasing in the United States and, and around the world, you give a very nice example of uh, Tiger Woods and the people who work at the Masters Tournament keeping the greens nice, which is a relatively unskilled job. Tiger Woods is a very skilled job. You use the example of Tiger Woods. He remains the most famous golfer in the world. He is not any longer the best golfer, but he will be the... Um, the kind of example we can use for a while, at least. Talk about what uh, what has changed in the prize money at the Masters and why relative to the greenskeepers' salaries. Yeah, and it says, I wanted to look at a sector or at a, an example that was not affected by sort of uh, corporate uh, greed or corporate governance problems. So uh, a fairly sort of a, a competitive, actually very competitive sector, like like uh, the, the sport industry, and this is in particular golf. And uh, golf is easy because uh, we have a pretty good tra- track record of price money and et cetera. And what is stunning is uh, the increase, uh, dramatic increase in the ratio between the price money of one particular golf tournament, which is the Augusta Master Golf Tournament, and the the minimum wage that is prevailing in the economy, which I assume is the the, the wage that you pay sort of uh, people who work in uh, um, in the golf course. Actually, I think and, they, uh, I think they make more, Luigi. But but let's use that as a rough approximation. Yeah, no, I, I know they make more, but I, I think it's, it was an easier sort yep. of a, a benchmark. And uh, and I don't think it would change dramatically if no. I were to do, do uh, otherwise. But the, the point is that uh, not only this number has increased dramatically, but it's increased dramatically, particularly since 1980. So uh, it, it parallels perfectly this acceleration of income inequality we've seen in any other sector. And what makes it uh, particularly sort of uh, uh, stunning is that uh, if you ask people, why do they participate at the golf tournament where the money is a primary concern? The answer is no. The prestige of the tournament is such that uh, people will participate just for the right to have the green jacket and the trophy and not the money associated with it. Right. So then the question is why the price money has exploded and why has it exploded since 1980? Because it, it, is- it seems wasteful. That- they don't, it's, you'd think if it's just the prestige, they could cut the prize money. Exactly. But the point is that uh, this uh, tournament is competing with other tournaments. And this tournament is making a gigantic amount of money. Uh, even if uh, it, this is, I think, the only tournament that is still owned by a golf club. So this is not uh, a profit maximizing uh, entity. And in fact, uh, they are undercharging for the price, uh, for the ticket prices, uh, because uh, you have a waiting list that lasts for years. And once you get the ticket, you can sell it on the internet for a multiple of the price you pay. So they're not really maximizing revenues by any stretch of the imagination. But it, it, this tournament uh, went from being a, a regional tournament where even a non-professional golf player could win. Uh, in, in 1948, the, the, the winner was sort of a, uh, somebody was playing golf uh, not full time. And uh, two a international event that is broadcasted uh, in most nations in the world, in, in uh, Australia and Japan, they wake up early to see it. 
uh, and uh, that produces so much revenue that you don't want to jeopardize the risk of uh, falling behind and becoming second to the British Open or the American Open just for uh, two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars. So, of course, you're going to up the ante just not to be behind the other tournament. And all the the tournament went up in prize money uh, starting in 1980. So, uh, I think it's just the um, enormous return that uh, this uh, tournament have that push up the prices. Yeah, and the and you you point the ratio then of the of the winner to the uh, or even the the runner up to the people who work at the at the uh, golf course is going to has increased tremendously and that's due to globalization and technology the ability of people around the world to enjoy the tournament which has pushed up the uh, profits to the to the club from hosting it uh, so I, I love that example it's obviously uh, a different view of inequality than the one that says that the somehow the rich have changed the rules of the game but of course that has also happened to some extent in certain sectors and that I want to talk about the financial sector in particular. But I want to start with a very interesting point you make about uh, the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Now, a lot of people uh, blame the crisis on the repeal of Glass-Steagall uh, and the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act that, that accomplished that in 1999. If I'm Nine, yeah. And uh, it was, of course, uh, it was a Democratic president who signed that, but I think it was a Republican Congress that pushed it. But it was a bipartisan bill. Uh, it got a lot of support from both sides of the aisle. And uh, you make the argument that its direct effect in causing the crisis was very small. So I want you to explain that. And then the more interesting point uh, is that – but you still point out the political implications of that were not small. And that that's fa- fascinating. So talk talk about those two things. First, why it had little direct impact, but its political impact was not not trivial. So, uh, just to make sure that everybody is on board, I think that uh, what Glass-Steagall used to do is to separate commercial banks from investment banks. And uh, in, uh, the, during the crisis, the uh, banks that were most exposed and suffer the most and some of them fail or had to be bailed out were pure investment banks that uh, would have existed even uh, uh, before the repeal of Glass-Steagall and would have got in trouble even before the repeal of Glass-Steagall. And uh, in fact, one of the solution or possible solution to this crisis was to uh, have some rescue. So you had JP Morgan buying Bear Stearns and you had Bank of America buying Mary Lynch. And uh, this was made possible by the repeal of Glass-Steagall because during Glass-Steagall, JP Morgan could not have bought um, uh, Bear Stearns and Bank of America could not have bought Mary Lynch. The only sort of uh, bad example, if you want, in this picture is Citigroup. Citigroup was uh, both an investment bank and a commercial bank and was highly exposed and uh, was really saved by the government because otherwise it would have gone bust. Um, and, the- and by the way, during the crisis, the, the way you got some confidence Howard, investment banks like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs is for them to file as commercial banks. Yeah. So uh, I think that uh, there's no question in my view is that uh, the separation of investment banking and commercial banking was not per se a, a factor in uh, causing the crisis, not even in precipitating the crisis. Did you mean to say that without Glass-Steagall, that if Glass-Steagall were still in place, that J.P. Morgan Chase could not have purchased Bear Stearns? Yeah, they Why? could not because it was an investment bank. Aren't they both investment banks? Uh, J.P. Morgan is a commercial bank. J.P. Morgan Chase is is actually both, but yeah. it is uh, as a huge commercial franchise. Okay, okay, so okay, I get the point then. Um, I wanted to ask you one more thing. Uh, oh, the uh, the argument for Glass Steagall, of course, is that commercial banks are FDIC insured, and the worry was that. It, the story is is that this would if you merge them then somehow the money kind of get mixed together would get got mixed together and that'll that made the investment banks that had commercial arms or vice versa too big to fail but the, the truth is the investment banks were viewed as implicitly insured anyway so it's um in a, in a way it does seem to be not a very important um piece of legislation the repeal of it 
but the political yeah and in, in addition sorry if i can add yeah. in in addition the investment banks were heavily exposed to commercial banks uh, <laughs> through sort of a uh, uh, a lot of loans so uh, if uh, an investment bank had failed it would probably sort of brought down the commercial banks that guarantee the credit so um, i the, the separation itself i don't think is is the most effective way to limit uh, risk and and it's and you're also suggesting it's it's a red herring when we think about what caused the the crisis itself. However, talk about the political implications because that that's really um, that's very clever. So my, my concern is about uh, the power that uh, uh, an industry has uh, in Washington, and this power is a function of how. Uh, large its firms are and how homogeneous its interests are. In a sense, uh, we know uh, as economists how important is the competition in the economic sector. Uh, we forget how important is the competition in, the, in Washington and in particular in the lobbying sector to have a uh, balanced view of the world. And uh, to the extent uh, financial firms have different interests, they sometimes lob one against the other. And uh, from this competition, you get a fairer and more balanced view. If you have uh, everybody agreeing in one direction, it's very difficult for the government to have a balanced view. Um, one uh, uh, economist who worked for the uh, Bush Treasury told me that during the summer of '08, every time... Uh, a cell number would call him, uh, and the area code was 212, uh, the message would be the same, buy toxic assets. <laughs> Everybody in Wall Street was lobbying in the same direction. And so is it that surprising that uh, the first proposal of Ang Paulson was buy toxic assets? That's all the advice he was getting. Uh, and I think that this homogeneity is, is a problem. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But you're, you give the example in the book of the bankruptcy law, which I think is a very nice example. Yeah, in, in a sense, uh, uh, the bankruptcy law is an extremely important and delicate law and uh, is not something that generally attracts the public interest uh, because, first of all, people don't think they will ever go bankrupt. They tend to be over-optimists, so they, it doesn't affect them. And two, uh, the devil is in the detail. And these are the, the exactly type of things that uh, are not really um, subject to a good public scrutiny because uh, we're all too busy to, to spend time looking at uh, the details of a law. So in general, uh, the game was played by a few constituencies and uh, the, historically, there were uh, divergent opinions, but uh, during the last reform in 2005, uh, there was a, a coalition that, according to a lot of bankruptcy experts, was remarkable in uh, the way they kept sort of uh, their positions united. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, the, the reason is as to be found in the fact that there was a massive consolidation in the financial industry. Uh, and as a result, everybody was doing the, exactly the same thing and everybody had the same interests. And so the natural uh, divergence of the interest that creates uh, um, competition, that creates uh, sort of a debate, uh, disappeared. And I, ironically, uh, they, they achieve their goal too well because it backfired for the financial industry itself. In what way? Because they, they, they reached two goals. The first one was to uh, make it extremely difficult to uh, file for bankruptcy uh, um, and get rid of your credit card debt, uh, which, again, in principle, is not a, a bad idea. Uh, but the result, because they were so successful, the result was that uh, many more people actually uh, were unable to pay their mortgage because in the past... Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, you will go into personal bankruptcy to get rid of uh, the credit card debt, but it will keep paying your mortgage and will, uh, will stay current on that because the mortgages don't go into personal bankruptcy. Uh, but now that you don't have that option, the only way that you had was basically uh, not to 
uh, to pay. And so, according to some studies, the number of bankruptcy during the recent financial crisis was significantly higher as a result of uh, uh, that law, and we know that there are some inefficiencies associated with the process, so there was quite a, quite a bit of money lost for that. The second is that uh, uh, one of the uh, features of the bankruptcy reform that very few people understood at the time it was passed is that it gives some kind of uh, super seniority in bankruptcy to all derivatives. Not only if you have a claim, a derivative claim, you are paid first, but you can basically renew that derivative with another counterparty and charge the cost, including the transaction cost, to the bankruptcy estate. And uh, now you think that the transaction costs are small because they represent like uh, 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 0.15% of uh, uh, the notional value, so it's only 15 basis points. However, the, the amount of uh, derivatives, the notion of value derivatives is so large that uh, this transaction cost become a, a pretty important one. So in the case of Lehman, uh, that alone accounted for roughly $60 billion lost in the bankruptcy estate. So that's not a trivial amount of money. So let me, let me make sure I understand this because I think a lot of people find uh, derivatives and uh, bankruptcy a little bit intimidating. The, the simple way I think of, only a little bit. <laughs> yeah, l- let me try to summarize what I. Th- I'm one of them, by the way, but I like to pretend I'm not. But the way I understand what you said is the following: there was a small provision that was not well known to the public, and maybe and not even well known to some of the insiders of this bankruptcy law of 2005 that allowed the holders of derivatives a very um, rarefied form of insurance to jump to the head of the line in bankruptcy and get first claim on the assets that were still available. Is that a correct summary? Exactly worse than that. that that's All right, sorry, correct. sorry. No, it's worse. Right, and it's worse than that. Go ahead. It's worse. Let me try. It's worse than that because not only do you get first claim, but you could even charge the remaining assets uh, a fee for uh, reestablishing the insurance policy with a different entity. Exactly. Oh, it's, exactly. It's an unbelievable thing. Uh, you'd think that would have encouraged the growth of derivatives. Uh, let's let's move mm. on. And it uh, did. <laughs> and it did, strangely <laughs> enough. Um, and it would be interesting for someone to look carefully at how that provision actually got in the law because somebody very wise uh, and fors- foresightful um, went and lobbied for that and got it done. Um, but anyway – but. but the- no, no, absolutely. I think, it's a, it, I think somebody should study because it's very important. But that's exactly the point I'm concerned about is uh, somebody is smart uh, was able to sneak that in without anybody sort of seeing it. Why? Because there was too much consensus. And it's a and, big uh, – And it's a big – If you have more dissension, that you have more discussion about these items. And that, that's what democracy is about. Uh, you try to avoid the mistakes before they're done. And the other point, which you make later, and I'm going to mention it now just in case we don't get to it because I think it's so it's so important, is that there may have been a time sometime in the past where you'd actually feel a little bit guilty lobbying to get that kind of change put in the law because it clearly is a way of, of sneaking to the head. It's like cutting in line, and cutting in yeah. line is socially uh, unacceptable in America. It's not as socially unacceptable in every country, but if you're at the grocery and someone elbows their way to the front and mumbles something about being in a hurry – uh, people get mad. If, if you explain, my car's on fire, my children are in there, I have to pay for my groceries first, people say, oh, go ahead, go ahead. But in general, you have to have at least a story to tell. And what this is, is a guy, a bank, somebody with a lot of derivatives said, hey, this is going to be good for us. And instead of saying, you know, it's just not right, they went and did it anyway. And um, the lack of shame, guilt, and... Um, Ethical behavior is uh, part of our problem, but I hope we can come back to that because you have some interesting things to say about it. But I just want to mention that that is implicit also in your in your discussion. Absolutely. So I wanted to spend some time. We don't have time because there's too many good things to talk about, but I just will mention to listeners that there's some beautiful metaphors in the book for understanding moral hazard and risk-taking. I'm referring to the asteroid and uh, and also the roulette wheel. So when you get, if you get the book uh, – You'll enjoy those sections, but I want to move on to some other issues. Uh, in particular, you talk about the growth of the financial sector in, in our economy 
and how wages of workers there have, have grown also dramatically. Why, why did that happen and what are the implications? So as economists, uh, we tend to uh, think that when a sector is growing, uh, is because it's producing more wealth. And when uh, uh, wages tend to be higher, is because people are more productive and they create uh, more value. And I think this is true in general. Uh, in particular, if there is no sort of distortion created by uh, some uh, mark, um, government intervention or some form of uh, monopoly. Uh, let me give you an example that I think uh, is familiar to a lot of people why uh, some form of monopoly can lead to uh, an extension of a sector that is not really justified by productivity but uh, is, re- is really distortive. Um, so take uh, the real estate agent sector uh, especially at a time where there was a multiple listing service that uh, could not be replicated uh, very easily, uh, it was a sector that has some market power. Um, however, it's a sector where there is also free entry. So it's not that uh, uh, the real estate agents are earning an extra amount of money uh, if they can charge more money to their clients. Is that too many people will enter into the real estate sector. The real estate sector, uh, the brokerage uh, sector would be too large and everybody on average would make, uh, at least in equilibrium, the same uh, wage that in any other sector. It's just that you have too many agents uh, in the economy doing too many deals each and so not being very productive. Too few few deals. You said too many, too few deals. Sorry, too few deals. Sorry, too few deals, yeah. So they're wasting a lot of time trolling for uh, clients because each one is worth a lot, but it's an artificially high amount. Is exactly, exactly. And, and you, you said it very well. Uh, the real waste is that in order to get uh, a listing, you have to sort of uh, uh, look for many, and uh, that's kind of uh, a, a time wasted. Uh, but uh, for you, it's, it's very valuable because once you get a listing, you get a lot of money. Yeah. So I think that uh, this, is, um, this is an example. Uh, I fear that in part, this is what happened in the financial industry uh, because uh, we uh, gave uh, some unique privileges to the financial industry. And one is sort of uh, this too big to fail uh, implicit subsidy uh, that uh, allows uh, some people to uh, earn an extra amount of money. So. Uh, the, the result is who is going to get uh, the value of this uh, subsidy and uh, could be the shareholders, but uh, uh, most likely are the managers in that industry. They're earning a disproportionate amount of money. And so that explains why so many graduates move into the financial industry and why the financial industry grew so much in recent years. And not all of it can be the result of uh, efficiency. Yeah, uh, the obvious other aspects, you know, you mentioned the too big to fail. Uh, we're going to come back and talk about that, but the, the willingness of the Federal Reserve to coddle the financial sector in various creative ways that go beyond its uh, narrow mission statements is, is also part of the problem. Yeah. So um, that's very depressing. Uh, let's move on to an even more depressing phenomenon, which you identify, and you, you give a um, – uh, what for me was a novel explanation. There is a famous uh, paradox associated with my colleague here at George Mason, Gordon Tullock, who noted that even though uh, businesses spend a great deal of money trying to influence political outcomes, in some sense, tragically and paradoxically, they don't seem to spend enough given how much is at stake. So given how much value uh, the government can transfer from the rest of us to the winners of legislative contests and, and special legislation and various things, uh, there's a huge incentive to steer that toward yourself. And if anything, even though the amounts are large, they don't seem large enough. You'd think people would spend more to be the winners of these legislative contests. They would spend more on candidates who would favor them. And there have been various explanations given for this. Uh, give us uh, some of those and then your explanation. So 
I think that uh, uh, I don't. I don't actually remember the other explanation. I only remember mine. Yeah, stick with yours. That's fine. <laughs> Which is no one. One explanation is that uh, is of course uh, politicians are not just interested in only money. They're interested in money and and votes. So uh, you you might decide for certain policies even if they uh, they're not sort of uh, you don't get money for that if you can get a lot of votes. But even if controlling for this factor, the, the Gordon Tullock's argument is, is really sort of uh, uh, very powerful. And uh, uh, in my interpretation, uh, the reason wh- there are two factors that sort of uh, explain that. One is that uh, it's an uh, uh, unbiased, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a biased competition because uh, uh, there, are, there is one side, which is generally business side, who can... Uh, collect money and marshal resources very effectively, and the other side that cannot, in the sense the uh, interest uh, of the people at large is not well coordinated, is not well funded. There was a friend of mine that say that the uh, truth is another special interest and a particularly not well funded one. Yeah, and I think that the, the same can be said in general for. Uh, public interest <laughs> uh, is another vested interest, but it's not a very well-funded one. And, yep. and I think that uh, the fact that the price is is, uh, is not high enough is because one side is not present at the bargaining table. Yeah. And so, so they so they don't they don't spend very much because they don't have to. <laughs> that's that's the it, argument. Yeah. It's, no, they can, they cheap. cannot afford to. They cannot. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, no, I, the yeah, I meant the, uh, the winning side. Saying, sorry, the the, go, the the yeah the, the winning side is not spending enough because they don't have to. Absolutely. Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead. But there's a second, and this is the the depressing part. But it's so it's um, possibly true. The second part is that uh, uh, traditionally there was a kind of a ideological buyer to sort of uh, uh, taking money. Uh, and uh, even on the business side, there was a bit of a reluctance to play the game in a very aggressive way. And uh, now business has learned how to do it very effectively. And so uh, there is very little uh, limitation on uh, an escalation. The fact that in the last few years we've seen an explosion is, uh, uh, I think, part of the result that business from being reactive has become proactive. And so in the past, much of the lobbying was to prevent uh, bad legislation from the government. And that's the reason why, uh, as conservatives, we, we didn't see lobbying as such a, a big cost because uh, uh, they were fighting along the same agenda. Uh, today, is so proactive that you wanted to create uh, legislation to favor me. And that's really bad in every dimension yeah the idea that that uh, earmarks for example are growing and that uh, special interest legislation is growing because they're getting better at it and are less ashamed of it is a deeply depressing but possibly a uh, very true uh, a true thing it's very um, very scary but 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 also absolutely but i want to stress because one part that i find it more difficult is that when i talk about sort of with free marketeers they tend to be uh more understanding of lobbying because they say lobbying is part of freedom of speech is part of democracy and i think all of this is true i don't deny that but I think they have this more benign version of lobbying because they think about the, the reactive lobbying, the, the lobbying against the government intervening. Well, there's and, another. Uh, the, the problem is the proactive go- uh, lobbying. I agree, but there's an even worse aspect that I find among uh, people who are free market oriented, of which I am certainly one. But uh, when I'll say, for example, that what's wrong with the financial system is that Goldman Sachs or Citigroup or others have lobbied the government for special favors. Uh, they often will reply, but that's, that's profit maximization. Yes, that's true, but, but it's, li- it's evil profit maximization. <laughs> it's the opposite of making a better product. It means it's a zero sum game. It's exploiting me. It's, and you. It's, it's a terrible, Justification. Well, what would you expect them to do? Well, the answer is I don't expect people to do everything that, that's legal but immoral. And if that's our, our social contract, if that's our, our culture, if that's our ethic, 
which, of course, you talk about later in the book, we're in big trouble. The only thing that, that discourages immoral activity is the law. Uh, because of transaction costs, that's going to be a very bad place to live, those kind of societies. Absolutely. And I think that uh, you, you really point the finger in, in, the, in the right spot is that, unfortunately, there is too much confusion between being pro-market and being pro-business. Absolutely. And uh, people tend to justify everything that business does as right just because you are for free markets. And, and the invisible hand. The invisible hand solves everything. It doesn't. That's not what Adam Smith said. <laughs> no. <laughs> If you read it, you didn't say that. <laughs> no, it said the opposite, actually, that businessmen like to get together to, to collude. And I, I certainly don't I, – I certainly accept the position that it's the government's – it's politicians who listen to that lobbying. They're equally at fault. But don't – please don't tell me that that's that just natural somehow and, and healthy that the businesses try to use the government to take money from the rest of us. That, that's a terrible thing. Anyway, let's, yeah. let's move on uh, to a related example, which uh, – a topic that I've – talked about a lot on the program, which uh, the example you use is Robert Rubin and, and moral hazard. So t- talk about Robert Rubin's um, role in um, increasing moral hazard. Yeah, I think that uh, what is important to understand, I want to sort of uh, speak more broadly and then I arrive to, to Rubin. And, and one thing that is important to understand is that the most dangerous lobbying is the lobbying that has a noble idea as a front uh, justification of it. So we know the damages that sort of uh, uh, the lobbying in favor of uh, uh, a home to every American has created because that sounds good. And so uh, everything that sounds good sounds difficult to resist. And one sort of uh, very pernicious form of lobbying has been this idea that we need to rescue uh, every country or every firm that is in financial trouble uh, because this is uh, uh, good for the country. And uh, this idea is a, a kind of a perverse mix between a sort of a more socialist of left-leaning uh, view that the government should be a benevolent uh, uh, player in the market economy and business interest that uh, businessmen are very interested in having the government intervening to absorb, absorb the losses, especially if they can keep the profits. Uh, and so I think that marriage is the worst possible marriage. And uh, uh, Robert Rubin, uh, who was sort of a worker at Goldman Sachs, uh, became Secretary of Treasury and then went to work at Citigroup, uh, represents the uh, symbol of this uh, dangerous marriage between business and uh, uh, more sort of a uh, welfare state attitude. And uh, he was uh, the ideologue behind a number of rescued from uh, the Mexico uh, bailout during the tequila crisis to the East Asian crisis. Uh, and uh, all this rescue uh, basically helped tremendously uh, the banks who lend the money to these countries get their money back uh, in, h- without uh, yeah. paying any cost of their sort of uh, aggressive lending. And that clearly uh, fostered more hazard because banks understood that the government will uh, sort of uh, save them whenever in trouble. And um, the uh, Rubin was also very instrumental in uh, the passage of uh, the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Um, and a uh, thing that is pretty sort of uh, sad, uh, left the Treasury and went to work uh, to uh, Citigroup, uh, a bank that was tremendously helped by the repeal of Glass-Steagall, within a few months, uh, when he stepped down and then went and worked for Citigroup within a few months. And at Citigroup, he got a position which was not an um, operating position, but was remunerated uh, extremely well. If I remember correctly, it was 20 million a year. Uh, and during that period, he, he was, he his was job paid. was basically to lobby the government. He, <laughs> he lobbied uh, the Bush administration trying to induce them to save uh, Enron. Um, and Enron, surprise, surprise, was a big client of Citigroup. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what he had done, according to an economist article, would have done would have been illegal if – uh, Clinton in the last day of our, in office would not have removed that ban uh, from uh, the law. So I think that uh, it was clearly something 
uh, not particularly uh, ethical. And uh, uh, Rubin did it, uh, was also, I think, quite instrumental in getting Citigroup uh, helped tremendously during the sort of uh, financial crisis. Tens and of billions of dollars. In spite of this, he walked away with uh, 140 million from Citigroup, a, a company that was on the verge of being bankrupt, and pays no reputational cost. So today, Rubin is uh, in the board of trustee of Harvard Corporation, allegedly probably the most prestigious uh, um, higher education institution in this country and the world. Yeah, but tens of. So, Tens of thousands right. of econ talk listeners think less of him now than they did before. So that that's some consolation. Uh, but yeah, it is uh, it's deeply depressing. I, I just want to make two comments on that. One is longtime listeners will recognize the phenomenon that Luigi is talking about of the marriage of high sounding ideals with narrow self interest as the bootlegger and Baptist uh, theory of regulation of uh, Bruce Yandel, and we have a podcast on that, and you can go check that out and re- read about it in more detail if you'd like. The other point I want to make, which uh, I think is crucial to make, is that, and even you said it this way, that you talked about the Me- the, the rescue, rescue of Mexico or the Mexican rescue, and it wasn't a rescue of Mexico. It was a rescue of Mexico's creditors who were mainly American banks, and uh, I noticed you cite in the article in your book an article from The Nation that, that, sh- that actually – Found the amounts that uh, Mexico was in debt to to uh, Goldman Sachs and City Citibank. I think at the time, right? It's billions. Yeah. It was billions of dollars. So that rescue, which was justified as for world stability and financial markets would collapse if rescue if Mexico defaulted, uh, those banks would have collapsed, which would have been a good thing because it would have sent a lesson to the rest of the world. And a few people did note it at the time uh, that this was a terrible rescue, and it was justified. Be- especially because it didn't cost the taxpayer anything. It was just a guarantee that never got invoked. Well, it was a guarantee that eventually paved the way for the 2008 crisis. And well, I want to close this section by your discussion of the sign at the Grand Canyon. So uh, you remember that piece of your book? I just read it. Oh, absolutely. It. So, that, talk about uh, that. Uh, when uh, you go to the Grand Canyon, there is a sign that says, please don't feel, feed the wild animals. And uh, – of course, the reason is that if you feed the animals, they don't they lose their habit of uh, uh, searching for food by themselves, and that's bad for their long term survival. Uh, I always wonder, if, number one, if uh, uh, why don't we put a sign like this in Washington so you shouldn't feed uh, sort of uh, the free enterprise system? But number two is is sort of uh, if the animals were in charge of setting a sign, they would probably not like to have the sign on the humans who put those signs there. So uh, businessmen don't like to put signs, don't feed us. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of the problem. We should be uh, us as larger people at large imposing uh, this, uh, these restrictions because that keeps the economy healthy and uh, the survival of the free market system in the long term. Yeah, just to quote uh, the interview we did with Milton Friedman, uh, he always liked to point out that uh, biz- business people love capitalism, but not for themselves. Their industry is always <laughs> special. It's different. So people always assume it's, again, this confusion between pro-business and pro-market that business – they're always surprised when business people lobby for special regulations or intervention. And they always say, well, but they're supposed to be capitalists. No, they're they're not. They have special interests that are very different from capitalism as a whole and consumers as a whole. Um, we um, – Let's turn now to um, – uh, well, actually, I want to – one more diagnostic observation before we get to some of your proposed solutions. Uh, you have a, a nice point about the divergence between wages and productivity. A lot of people have pointed out that wages and productivity uh, have diverged in in uh, going back to – I think it's the mid-'70s. They used to pretty much go yeah. together, and now all of a sudden they seem to be – very different that the workers don't get their what they produce anymore and this has also encouraged a lot of people to be very anti free market but uh, you make some very thoughtful observations on that divergence yeah i think that part of the this divergence is due to the difference between uh, compensation and wages and uh, uh, one of the major item in this difference is uh, the cost of health care. So the feeling that most uh, Americans have that their wages are not going up in real terms 
is true, but it's not because companies don't pay them more and more. It's because a larger fraction of that is absorbed in cost of healthcare. And so you don't see uh, this cost because it is on purpose hidden from you. Yeah. It's taken away uh, before you get your pay stab and you don't, you're not allowed to choose. You're not allowed to bargain for uh, maybe a different combination of uh, cost and products. And uh, in a sense, that's a, a huge subsidy to the healthcare industry. Yeah. So that's one reason. The other reason that was a, is a different uh, measurement problem, right? It's about, uh, you have a second. Yeah, it's how, how you sort of uh, deflate uh, the productivity. And uh, there is clearly a divergence in, in the uh, different cons- pr- price indices. And in particular, the price index that includes uh, both uh, uh, the cost of uh, um, business uh, production and the cost of non-business production, which is mostly sort of education and healthcare, which are not part of uh, the traditional business sector, it goes up at a much uh, higher rate because the cost of healthcare and the cost of education has gone up more than the cost of uh, other goods. It's also, I've seen other studies that point out that the, uh, the mix of uh, computer and other uh, costs to business are very different. Technology is very different than for the consumer. The, the amount we consume and when that use different baskets uh, and different uh, measures of, of inflation and trying to deflate the nominal numbers to real is part of that. Is a part of that. But what you show is that the difference is it's small. Is that once you make these kind of corrections, but it's still there. There is still some gap. Maybe it would be due to some measurement error, but it could be that actually there's change in uh, in how our private sector economy, the free market part that's left, uh, actually does compensate people. And you then turn to the ways we can fix that or make it better, which obviously focus on things like improving education for people who have low skills and low productivity. Yeah, I think that th- this is actually one of the biggest problems we are facing today in America. Uh, Everybody is focusing on sort of uh, the business cycle fluctuations and uh, I think it's terrible that unemployment is higher than it used to be, but I think there are some more scary long-term trends. And one, which a colleague of mine has, has pointed out, is that if you look at the employment of uh, uh, prime age U.S. males, and again, uh, it's not because females are not important, it's because uh, when you look historically, there's been less change in sort of attitude to our participation in males than in females. Uh, from 1979 to today, the employment went down from 79% to 69%. So these are, when I uh, say employment, uh, uh, these are not also people that are just uh, out of work. These are people that are out of the workforce. An increasing number of prime labor. age male You're talking about don't labor participate force. Yeah. to the labor force. You're talking about labor force participation. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the question is, is why? I think that there is not a, a full answer to that, but in part is that they, they give up yeah. because uh, they don't really have uh, uh, an attractive uh, um, job. And uh, it's sort of a, if you start, the, the more intense the competition is and uh, the more unequal the payoff is, the more people who are a bit behind uh, give up altogether. We did a... Uh, so, we did a- we did an interview with David Autor of uh, MIT on the growth and disability, which is part of those people who've dropped out of the labor force because they're paid to. They don't get a lot of money from disability, but some of their labor market options are not very good either, and that's what they've turned to. We made it more yeah. generous and easier to get. Uh, no, I think that this this is a, a serious problem. And again, uh, using my, my golf example, if – the way in which uh, sort of uh, golf keeps a, a game interesting when two people have a very different uh, ability is to create an handicap. Uh, if you were to play with people with a very different handicap uh, than you uh, on an equal footing, you would not, you, you probably not play because the game would not be interesting. And, uh, and I think uh, we need to try to do something in that direction, uh, both to sort of uh, not waste valuable resources but also to create the sense of uh, uh, that everybody has a, a, a fair shot because that's crucial to the consensus we are discussing earlier. Yeah, well, I'd get government out of the education business. You propose vouchers, and uh, there's a private 
sector uh, solution coming, which is uh, websites like Udacity that Sebastian Thrun has started. And I'm hoping to get him as a guest soon on Econ Talk. I appreciate the people encouraging me to interview him. But that's going to, I think, change the face of, of public education uh, and private education. It's going to be a good thing. Yeah, but I think that uh, uh, many people are uh, opposing vouchers because they claim that uh, uh, it disadvantages kids whose parents are not particularly attentive or not particularly able to select schools. And I think that they have an argument on this ground, but if you want, this can be easily be fixed by making vouchers uh, different in value. If you think that uh, some uh, uh, kids are particularly disadvantaged, you can make their voucher be more valuable so that the school seeks, seeks them out. Um, uh, and I think that uh, that would be a private sector solution to the problem of uh, uh, poor uh, neighborhoods and so on and so forth. Yeah, the, the problem I have, I have a different problem from the other side, which is I think part of the problem with public education is that people don't pay for it. And people don't pay for something, they don't take it, they don't treat it as well as something they've earned. And I think giving away schooling is part of our problem. I worry that if we have vouchers, there's going to be political pressure to increase the size. Um, but I always, when everybody complains about whatever solution like that is, I always say, compared to what? You know, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's unfair to, to low income people who have trouble selecting their, as opposed to now. I mean, it's disgusting. It's, it's, yeah. it's a criminal thing. What, what, what people have done to stop. More competition in the schooling business. It's terrible. Um, or it should be criminal, but it's certainly unethical. We don't have a lot of time. I, I want to, I want to talk a little bit. We've got about five minutes. Um, you talk a lot at the, in the book about ethics, which is an area that most economists are uncomfortable with. And, uh, the way that I think most business schools have handled the ethical problem is by having a course on it, which I think is kind of funny. Um, but talk about, the role of trust and ethics and how we might move toward a, some self-enforcing uh, improvements on uh, rent-seeking and other problems we've been talking about. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, business schools have relegated uh, ethics to separate courses because uh, uh, we economists have always been very uncomfortable with uh, uh, even the notion of any Ethic, and uh, we uh, like to uh, pretend we are sort of scientists, like uh, uh, physicists. Uh, but there is a, a big difference. Uh, physicists don't teach to atoms uh, the, the law of physics. We teach to individuals the law of economics. And so our teaching, uh, whether we want it or not, has an impact on uh, what people do. And uh, uh, so even if we don't say that uh, something is right or wrong, when we say that it is irrational to vote, for example, I don't think is, uh, is really conducive of people uh, participating actively in, uh, in the electoral system. Um, and uh, I am not uh, a moral philosopher, so I don't want to talk about sort of uh, ethic with the capital E or sort of uh, uh, religious morality or, or right or wrong in, in, in absolute terms. But as economists, we know the certain behaviors are uh, detrimental to society overall. Uh, so it's not a question about redistribution. Very, very often people talk about moral as, as a way to redistribute. Here, uh, I'm really sort of uh, staying with the uh, economic uh, paradigm of efficiency, but still from an efficient point of view, uh, lobbying very heavily to get some uh, uh, special uh, tax advantage, etc. This is, we know, is uh, detrimental to uh, society overall. And uh, being neutral, not taking any position, is indirectly endorsing this attitude. And I think that uh, we should stand up and, and, and criticize that openly in class. And even in, at some level, have uh, some social norms within uh, our alumni community that certain behaviors are not considered good. After all, we do uh, have students sign a, a code of uh, honor about not cheating in exams. Uh, and uh, cheating exams, if you're not caught, it is in the self-interest of people. 
uh, that's exactly why we have a code. But why are we willing to sort of uh, uh, have them sign that code and we don't have a code about not cheating in business or not cheating by sort of rigging the rules of the game uh, through lobbying? Couldn't agree with you more. Um, at, at a minimum, we as economists who understand the effects of these laws should be uh, encouraging people to feel guilty when they do when they steal money from their fellow citizens on behalf of their institutions. It's just wrong. And that would include, as you point out very well in the book, our own institutions, <laughs> educational institutions, which have their own earmarks and their own uh, lobbying efforts. Uh, we are the beneficiaries of lots of rent-seeking. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. My guest today has been Luigi Singales. Luigi, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. My pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.